going live. All right. Praise the name of the Lord. Start broadcasting. God bless you. Thank you for being with us this evening. Uh, my name is uh, Max Flynn. I'm president of Covenant Theological. Well, can you talk? Covenant Theological Seminary in Greenville, North Carolina. And uh, many of, of the viewers, uh, I've been working LinkedIn and sending out uh, connections with many ministers, and a number of them had gone to the Covenant Theological Seminary in, in Missouri. So we're, we're a small one in Greenville, North Carolina, and uh, we're in 30 countries. We work strong with the International School of Ministry and several other uh, ministers uh, who work out of there. So uh, we're called to equip ministers for the work of the ministry. Now, there's a lot of things going on with this uh, computer tonight. I, uh, uh, I am totally a, a novice, and uh, the Brother Lee is even more than me a novice. <laughs> and uh, tonight is our first broadcast, and God has really shown me that he wants me to minister to people ministers in particular who are hungry all over the world so they can uh, learn what I've learned. And not just me, but uh, other people who uh, have matured in the ministry. As a matter of fact, I'll give you a scripture in Romans chapter 1. If you have your Bible, if you don't, it's all right. But in Romans chapter 1, this is the scripture the Lord gave me for this, uh, for this uh, ministry. Romans chapter 1, Paul said to the Romans, For I long to see you, now I use a new King James Version, For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift, so that you may be established. Now, the next verse is really the understanding of what he's talking about, verse 12. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith of you and me. And, and I, I, you know, a lot of people... When you're younger, uh, you think you can do a lot of things, and, and you can do a lot of things. But uh, Jesus said, you, without me, you can do nothing. And uh, you can do a lot of things in the flesh. But as you mature and get older and over, over, older, you cannot do the same things that you did when you were younger. And uh, again, as you get older, you realize you need a lot of help uh, in a lot of areas that you didn't need before, you thought you didn't need. So... Uh, the two parts to this, I'm read it again. For I long to see you that I may impart to you a spiritual gift or some spiritual gift so that uh, you may be established. That is that, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith of both you and me. And tonight we have uh, Dr. Lee Thomas. And I don't know whether you can see him on the small screen. I can see him down at the bottom and he'll be speaking in a couple of moments. But uh, I, I came across Dr. Thomas's uh, book, I don't know, about five or six years ago. This has uh, got my name on it. And uh, I, I was up this morning uh, very early and I studied some things, and I'm going to probably ask him some questions. I'm going to let him share some things in a moment. Uh, but, but anyway, uh, we need each other. And the Lord has given Brother Lee some revelation knowledge that I don't have. And I've actually had one of my associates, Apostle, Doctor, uh, if she was here, I'd call her the Reverend Apostle Doctrine uh, uh, Bernitha Muzon. Uh, we've been actually going through this book for several months, and we've been preaching every other, every other week. Uh, like I preach Sunday. Yes, I did. I preach this Sunday. Next week she'll preach, and the next Sunday I'll preach. And I've asked her, she's preached... Uh, uh, several times on the subject, but has not really got in, gotten into the book. And so uh, I asked her to uh, take it chapter by chapter. And it's amazing how much we're learning. Uh, Brother Lee uh, will tell you himself. We've got, I don't know if you see the pop in, uh, there's a pop up on my screen here. Uh, I don't know if you see it, but anyway, uh, there's 43 pages. The last page is uh, biblical art. Big, can't even talk tonight. Uh, last pages of the work cited, uh, but this book is uh, this book could be 343 pages. It's got so much uh, um, meat in it. It's so good and so powerful and so strong. So uh, anybody could spend uh, a number 
of months in this book, learning it and applying it and praying it and believing it. It's just awesome. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is uh, I have some gifts that God wants me to offer you. And I've got this, uh, this screen needs to be able to adjust a little bit better. And you have some gifts that needs to be offered to me. And we want to do that. We want to mutually edify and build up the body of Christ so that we can build up the body of Christ so the Lord can come back. I believe we're on the verge of his coming, but he's not going to come until the Bible says, until the gospel has been preached into all the nations, nations that is, and that, that God is going to clean us up. He's going to turn us on. We're going to go preach the gospel everywhere, just like they did in the first century. And I don't believe it's going to be the older ones. Uh, I'm my white hair that's shining. Brother Lee's hair is white as well. Uh, I'm 74 years young. And uh, my dad, who is still living, I talk to him every day. He is 96. He will be 97 in October. And uh, we've got longevity in our family. And uh, but, but anyway, uh, as you get older, uh, back to the thing, you, you know that you cannot physically do the things that you did were, when you were younger. So God wants us to become fathers in the faith. That is where we invest our knowledge. I believe that Oral Roberts did more good, powerful work in the last five years of his life than he did in all the years, years prior to that. Because what he did in the last five years of his life, uh, he was at, of course, Oral Roberts University. Uh, he uh, People would make appointments with him, and they would come and spend some days, and a few days with him. And he imparted into them the things that he learned and things that he knew. I believe he did a greater work in the last five years of his life because he was imparting to the younger generation what they needed. Listen, uh, if we can learn some things, we don't have to, you don't have to go through the hard things that we went through. And forerunners always have to pay a price. Uh, as things get easier, and like just like my children, my children does not have to work as hard. Or, or they have much more than we ever had. But my father and his father uh, worked harder and had to do a lot more than we did. So every generation, it seems, in the prosperity we've had in America, have it a little bit easier. But the reason why we have is because someone went before us and paid the price and broke the ground and planted the seed. And it's kind of like uh, getting getting a uh, a uh, buying a you know ten acres and it's got nothing but trees on it. Well, if you want to farm it, you got to uh, hopefully sell the trees, and then you got to get the logs out, and you got to get the stumps out, and then you got to you got to do the, do the work you got to do. Anyway, uh, I'll say more about that later. I have uh, I have brother Lee Thomas with me again. He's on the right side. I don't know, don't know whether uh, you see him or not. I'm going to take this pop out out remove pop out and see, uh, got 14 on, praise the Lord. Uh, 15 just came on, uh, praise the Lord. Uh, 50, 52 register, now I'm telling things probably ought not say. But anyway, I'm gonna come back to this book. Uh, about five or six years ago, somebody somewhere handed me this book. And I read it, and when I was an evangelist, uh, I'll, I'll get to that long, I wanna let him say a few things. When I was an evangelist, the most often prayer request was for me to pray for uh, people's household. And so it's always been a real um, burden for me to see people with lost saved ones. And so I've always had a desire to see that. And when I got a hold of this book, I jumped into it and ate it up. I mean, I absolutely ate it up. I outlined it and fell in love with it. And I, I sent, uh, we actually had a copier. I, uh, I didn't, uh, I didn't cut that book up to scan it, but I got another one later and I scanned it into a PDF. So I'd have it, but, uh, I just, I just loved it. And I believe I sent brother Lee a copy of my outline a long time ago, but anyway, uh, we've had a number of occasions of, of speaking and I met with him last year. I believe it was in, uh, the end of September, the first of October for a few moments. So we actually scheduled a meeting on October 16th, I believe it was. And I'll tell you more about that later. But anyway, uh, Brother Lee, uh, he is the author of this book. And I want him to share with us, Brother Lee, I think you were a pastor. Kind of tell us the background of this book and how you wrote it. And, and then we'll, in a moment, we'll let you tell a lot of the things you've seen. So 
God bless you, brother. Go ahead. When you start talking, I'll disappear. All right. Well, I've been a soul winner probably about all of my adult Christian life. And I started winning souls on the streets of Key West, Florida in 1969. And uh, I was 20 years old. And so I've been a soul winner for all these years. I'm now 66. Uh, and I always knew that the key was prayer. We did a lot of prayer and, and, uh, and we saw God do some incredible things. And I came to the church, the last church I pastored, I was, I was there for nine years and uh, I went into full-time evangelism 11 years ago. I'll be starting my 12th year in full-time evangelism next month. While I was at uh, this particular church, uh, had one of my members that came to me one day and said, Brother Lee, would you help me pray for my family? And so he had to go to work early in the morning. So we had built a little prayer chapel. And so every morning at five o'clock, uh, Monday through Friday, he and I would meet in the prayer chapel and pray for his family members. We'd call them by name. We'd pray for them for an hour and uh, from five to six before we went to work. We did that for months, and not a single one of them got saved. Now, some of them did get saved. Uh, just a few months ago, I buried a uh, priest at funeral for his twin sister, uh -huh. and uh, she was one, one of the ones we prayed for, so she did get saved, but I don't know how many others, but anyway, we, we weren't seeing the results, and so I just began to pray and say, God, uh, I know prayer is the key to see lost people get saved. Uh, would you show me how to do it? Because what we're doing doesn't seem to be working. And uh, God just began to reveal truths to me. Uh, for example, I would read a scripture and he would just show me things I'd never, never seen before. For example, in the book, I talk about how the, the Holy Spirit sanctifies a lost person. Right. And I use a hula hoop to illustrate how uh, you're in that circle of uh, sanctification and the Holy Spirit gets in there with the person and uh, begins to work on them and uh, brings them to the place of salvation. And he does that with every single lost person. Right. And so uh, the Lord just began to reveal that to me and, and help me understand it. Uh, he began to show me that if we didn't pray for lost people, they wouldn't get saved. That was the key. That's what the whole first chapter is about. And so uh, the Lord just began to reveal these truths to me. Uh, one of the greatest truths, I guess, was uh, uh, in, in Luke, uh, chapter 11, verses 21 to 22, uh, when he talks about uh, when a strong man armed guards uh, his palace, his goods are at peace. The strong man is the chief demon that controls a person. In this case, the palace is a person. But the next verse says, but when a stronger than he comes up on him and overcomes him. And the stronger than he is you and me as Christians. First John 4, 4. Great is he that's in us and he that's in the world. And we overcome him, take away his armor in which he's trusting, and then we spoil his goods. So the demon's armor is going to be a stronghold. It's a mindset. Right. And the right. Bible says, if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them who are lost, and whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not. And he blinds the mind so that uh, the gospel cannot penetrate. For example, your brain is part of your physical body, and your brain collects tons of information through your five senses. But your mind is part of your soul. Your soul is your mind, your will, your emotion. And so your mind uh, processes this information. So when the devil blinds the mind of a lost person, uh, he's got him thinking and processing information in such a way that he cannot understand how to be saved. For example, when Moses sent the 12 spies into the land of uh, Israel uh, to check it out, the land of Canaan, uh, all of them came back and said, it's, it's a wonderful land, flow of milk and honey. Uh, but 10 of them said they're giants and walled cities. We can't take the land. Well, God had already said, I've given you the land. Only Caleb and Joshua are the only ones that believe that. Right. So one of these other, other 10 leaders say, we can't take the land. Well, they had a slave's mentality. They'd been slaves all of their lives in Egypt. Their daddies had been slaves all of their lives in Egypt. And they had a slave's mentality. So when they saw these giants in walled cities, they just automatically assumed, we can't, we can't win this war. And so what happens with a lost person is, the devil's had them thinking wrongly for so long, that they can't receive the gospel and understand it. And so when the Lord began to show me how these things work, uh, it really opened up my mind and understanding to uh, praying for lost people. And uh, if we don't pray for them, they're not going to get saved because a demon controls the way they think. Right. It's like a wild man of Gadara. You know, when Jesus uh, came to that place, he found this man who wasn't wearing any clothes. He'd been cutting himself with stones. He lived among the tombs. He cried day and night. No man could tame him. 
Uh, and when Jesus approached him, he asked a very simple question. He said, what is your name? None of us know the man's name because he never answered. The Bible says the demons answered, and they said, our name is Legion, for we are many. Right. Now, Legion is a, a Roman military term. It was a small army of over 6,000 soldiers. So if these demons were telling the truth, this man had over 6,000 demons in him. That's why he acted the way he did. But Jesus <laughs> cast the demons out of the man. Right. The demons went into a, a herd of hogs, about 2,000 hogs, which leads me to believe that probably at least 2,000 demons, one for every hog. Hogs run in the lake and drown themselves. The town folk come out to see what's going on, and they found this man, totally wild, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. Wow. And in his right mind, he said to the Lord Jesus, I want to go with you. And so here's what we have to understand. Anybody in their right mind would choose heaven <laughs> over hell every single time. A lost person is not in his or her right mind because the demon controls the way they process information. That doesn't mean they're crazy. It doesn't mean they're insane. It does mean that they cannot hear gospel truth and process it. And so our job is to bind the strong man and take away his armor in which he's trusting, which is going to be that mindset. And when we do that, sometimes the person just comes instantly open to salvation. Sometimes you pray for somebody for a long time, and all of a sudden they just instantly come open to salvation. I've got a friend in uh, Wyoming. He has been, he'd been praying for an atheist for almost five years. Uh, and uh, he called me one day and he said, uh, the Holy Spirit spoke to me on Friday and said, call this man uh, who was an atheist. He was a matter of fact, he was a university professor. Right. And, uh, uh, and my friend said, I don't want to call him. And the Holy Spirit said, call him. And, and my friend said, I don't want to call him. And the Holy Spirit said, call him. This is on a Friday. So he calls this atheist and said, I need to talk to you. So, he said, well, I come to your house on Tuesday. So this atheist, who was a university professor, came to my friend's house on Tuesday, and my friend began to witness to him. He said, suddenly he just threw up his hands. He said, stop, wait a minute. He said, I thought he was about to walk out on me. But instead, he said, he starts praying. And this atheist begins to pray, and he says, God, Charlie is trying to help me. Would you help him help me? Wow. And, uh, and he, he got saved. He was broken. Uh, but listen to this. He told my friend, he said, I had not, I've not been to church in decades. And this last weekend, we went to our old hometown, I don't know where it was. And a friend of mine said, uh, how about going to church with me Sunday? He said, well, why not? He said, I went to church Sunday for the first time in decades. But it was on Friday when God told my friend to call him. See, God knew he was getting him ready. Amen. And so yeah. what happens is when you and I pray for lost people, the Holy Spirit works on them and prepares their heart. And, uh, and sometimes it happens quickly. Sometimes it takes a little while, but it will happen if I believe it will stay with it. Amen. Let me, uh, that is awesome. Let me share a couple of things. The Lord, uh, about every December for the last four or five years, the Lord has just done a work. Uh, December has always been a, a lighter month for me. Uh, school is out just a little bit by the second week and, and you've got a lot of th activities going on, but I, I don't have to do the normal studying and preparation I do. And the Lord really began to speak to me last December about being a witness, being a soul winner again. And Lee, I have to admi uh, uh, admit, I hate to do it. It's embarrassing to uh, do it. When I first got saved, uh, nobody had ever told me how to be saved, as far as I know. Maybe they did, but I didn't, I didn't get it. Just kind of like this guy you're talking about. But anyway, uh, once I was born again, I told everybody everywhere I went uh, about the Lord and witness it. I was just a strong witness. But uh, now I'm fulfilled in my ministry. I'm equipping, I'm training ministers to do the work of the ministry. And when I'm functioning, teaching the classes, you cannot know and find us more satisfied man because I'm functioning in what I'm called to do. But, uh, you know, you can get comfortable in your call, and the Lord began to show me that I had forsaken a number of things, but one of them was being the witness he'd called me to be, and the church had forsaken. And I believe we're in the part of the problems we're in today because we don't witness like we should. And so anyway, I got, I got turned on. I started to read things I used to read and listen to things I used to listen to, study things I used to study and pray about things and cranked up. My, I was I always used four spiritual laws cranked up my four spiritual laws again, and I've got some adapted ones that I use so you don't have to use a booklet. And I began to witness again. 
and uh, and I have every place I'd go, I, I would ask a person, uh, has anyone ever explained to you the four spiritual laws, or have you ever heard the four spiritual laws? And of course, most of them said no. And I'd just take them to the four spiritual laws, and then down at the bottom, it says uh, you read them a prayer, and you you say, uh, does this prayer express the desire of your heart? And uh, some say yes, yeah, and some say no. But anyway, I, I began to have some people pray with me. But Lee, uh, one of my discouragements with the four spiritual laws, which I love and I kind of spiritually grew up on it was, it used to be, you know, you get people saved for about three months. In other words, they would come to church for about three months. Next thing you know, they'd fall away. And then the last couple of years, you get somebody saved for about three weeks, it seemed like. And lately, you get them saved that don't last three days. <laughs> but it's they don't repent and they're not really saved to start with. But the Lord showed me it was more than just witnessing. In other words, I got cranked up on witnessing again, and I began to witness, but I wasn't having any real fruit. And I, I began to say, Lord, what? You know, why? Just kind of like you said, you'd been praying for that family for, you know, quite a while. And you begin to say, Lord, this is, you know, you need to teach me how to do this. And as you did, God began to teach you these things. Well, that's when I got hold of your little book again. Uh, you sent me a case of them in October uh, last year. And uh, anyway, I got back at this book again. I said, that's it. That's the key. Prayer is the key. We all are called to be witnesses. We all need to know and have a plan of salvation. But we need to know how to pray effectively so that their eyes will be open, their ears will be open, their heart will be open, so the seed of the Word of God can go in there and rebirth them, make them be born again, resurrect them from the dead. And so that's when I got turned on to your book again. And uh, it, is, it is awesome. And I say, I say that because some of the things that you say uh, are, are kind of, I don't want to say dogmatic, but they're, you say them in a strong way because you know them to be true, and they are true. So I, I'm just saying to those who are watching me and listening to me, and I'm going to ask you a couple questions about this in a moment, uh, we, you can download this book at our site free, and I can't tell you what, uh, just go to www.maxflynn.com, and you can download this book free. Now, we've got to give you in a, free, a few moments an offer where you can buy the hard and the, and the t tapes and the CDs and all of it. But anyway, this is one of the most powerful books I've ever read. Uh, Watchman Nee, The Normal Christian Life. That is one of the most powerful books I've ever read, and I've taught it, and I teach it in seminary. There are books or tools, and uh, I have had a step had a stepfather. He's passed and gone on to be the Lord, and uh, he would buy tools. He was a, he was really an engineer, not uh, not educated in the university. He was just gifted to do all that stuff. And one day I went with him at a yard sale. We went to stay at my mom's. And she lived at that time in the Lake of Coachubby. I'm from South Florida, Southwest Florida, Fort Myers, Florida. My mother was in the Lake of Coachubby, Florida. That's at the bottom of the lake. That's where the town was. Well, anyway, we went to a yard sale, and he found some of the best. I mean, some of the some of the most expensive tools you could find, and got them for almost nothing. He was he was so excited, and we went back to the house. He was out there cleaning them up. I was there with him just to spend time with him. And all of a sudden, brother, it dawned on me. It dawned on me that our tools are books in the Bible. Our tools. And we need tools to do the work God's called us to do. And this is one of the tools that we need. And this is, you know, again, uh, you, you say these things strong, and I'm not, I'm not criticizing that at all, because that's what you believe, that's what you know, and that's what you've seen, and it's a fact. But a lot of people hear it, and they don't know whether they can believe it or not. I promise you, you can believe it. And I promise you, if you get in this book and study it and meditate on it and listen to it and start praying the principles in this book, it will work for you, won't it? Well, absolutely. I had a lady call me this morning from Kentucky, and uh, we spent probably 30 minutes on the phone, and she'd been praying for her husband. And the more she prayed for him, the worse he got. And so finally, <laughs> uh, uh, she had to ask him to leave the house. His uh, her 17-year-old daughter had already left the house. She couldn't stand it around there. Right. He was he was verbally abusive and all these things, but she said, the more I prayed for him, he just got worse. And and I said, well, it's because your prayers were working. 
Uh, right. when, you pray, when you pray for somebody that's lost, you're making the devil turn them loose. That's what you're doing. That's right. And the devil knows that, and so he uh, he he tries to make the person act worse so that you'll quit you'll quit praying for him. And here's one of the key things that, that folk need to understand when you pray for a lost person. There's always one key issue uh, that keeps that person from being saved. And so in Luke 11, 21 and 22, when he talks about taking away uh, the strong man's armor, he's talking about that mindset. And so right. a person may have a dozen different sins or mindsets that's against the will, word will of God, but one of them is the key. For example, the rich young ruler, his was greed. And mm -hmm. when the Lord confronted him with getting rid of his money, he turned and walked away. The woman at the well, her problem was lust. When he said to her, go call your husband, she said, I don't have a husband. He said, well, that's right. You've been married five times. Now you live with a man you're not married to. That was the issue. Didn't mean she didn't have other sins in her life, but that was the key issue that, that kept her from being able to receive spiritual truth. Right. And so, right. so what we do when we're praying for a lost person is we're binding the strong man. That's what Jesus had to do in Mark 3, 27. No man, not even Billy Graham, no man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods except he first bind the strong man. And the strong man's the chief demon that controls the person. Right. In uh, right. Matthew 12, uh, the Lord talks about how a demon goes out of a man. He can't find a place he likes, so he comes back to his house. He went out of a man. He came back to his house. The man was his house. Right. And he brings right. seven more demons with him, Jesus said. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So what you have to do is bind the strong man. And then you take away his armor in which he's trusting. So it's good for us to know uh, what that armor is. Uh, it's going to be a mindset. But we, you know, it's either greed or lust or bitterness or religion or apathy or pride. Uh, it, could be, it could be one of many, many different things. But the point I want to make here is that in every lost person, uh, there's one key issue. You, your person may have many, but there's always one key issue. Uh, is that what is that what this uh, is that what this this is a mind this is a this is a picture, and you got a red thing right in here. So is that what that right. represents? The black silhouette represents uh, the head represents the mind. The red uh, stronghold represents unbelief. Okay. And every lost person has unbelief, the stronghold of unbelief. Right. The other strongholds represents things like lust, bitterness, greed, and so forth. But what you have to do is you have to break the lust or the bitterness or the greed before the gospel can penetrate to the to the one of unbelief. Because you see, the devil guards that. The only sin that sends to hell is unbelief in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Right. Nobody goes to hell because they're uh, murderers or liars or thieves or prostitutes or drug addicts. Those folk may go to hell, but that's not why. They right. go because they have not trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And so the devil guards that particular stronghold of unbelief because uh, he knows if that's ever broken, they're going to get saved, just like the wild man of Gadara. Right. So, right. for example, the rich young ruler, his was greed. When the Lord said to him, you got to get rid of your money, and that doesn't mean every rich person has to get rid of his money to get saved, but this man did because Jesus knew his money was his God. Right. And uh, when he heard that, he turned and walked away very sorrowful for he is very rich. And so what happens is uh, if you're doing the witnessing for the, to the person, you need to know what the issue is so you can deal with it. Right. Uh, for example, I was in, uh, I was in uh, Kentucky doing a meeting and the pastor woman to go with him to witness to a lady they'd been ministering to. So we went to see this lady. She was about 60 years old at the time. Uh, the pastor witnesses to her and uh, encourage her to trust Christ. And she just starts talking about other stuff. It's right. like she never heard what he said about being saved. So I take my turn. I witness to her. She does the same thing to me. She starts talking about <laughs> stuff and I do being saved. So the pastor starts talking to her for the second time. While he's talking to her this time, I'm silently praying. Right. And I'm saying, Lord, what is the issue in her life? What is it that keeps her from even hearing what we're saying about being saved? And the Holy Spirit spoke the word molestation to my spirit. Now, the pastor's talking to her, so I couldn't interrupt and say, hey, have you ever been molested? So guess what happened? The Holy Spirit revealed it to the pastor. Right. So the pastor just stopped what he's saying. He looked at this lady. He said, uh, have you ever been molested? Had nothing to do with the conversation. I wish you folk could have seen this. This lady just hung her head. Uh, and when she could finally compose herself, she looked up with tears in her eyes, and she said, when I was nine years old, my girlfriend's grandfather molested me. Wow. And I said to her, well, you got to forgive this guy because the real issue here was bitterness, mm -hmm. unforgiveness. 
I said, you've got to forgive this guy. She said, well, I have. But she hadn't. We spent about an hour talking to this lady. And when we left, she was still lost. But here's what happened. While we were there, two or three times, we'd be talking along. All of a sudden, she'd just say, uh, I would never hurt children. Had nothing to do with the conversation. Right. We'd talk a little bit, and all of a sudden, she'd say, I would never hurt children. Well, the first time she said that, I'm thinking, what is she talking about? Is somebody accused of hurting children? But folk, after the Lord revealed to me that she'd been molested as a nine-year-old girl, I understood what she was talking about. She was basically saying, I would never do to another child what was done to me. Now, this had happened to her when she was nine years old. She was about 60 years old when we witnessed to her. It had happened over 50 years before. She had never gotten over it. She had never forgiven the guy that molested her, and we didn't want her to cry either. And until she forgives the guy that molested her, the devil is going to use that mindset, that stronghold, Right. to keep her uh, from trusting Christ. I was in Lexington, Kentucky doing a meeting. And uh, at the end of the service, we had a uh, question answer time. And there was a medical doctor there that night. And so he asked this question. He said, how do you find out what the issue is? Because as a medical doctor, he understood how important this was. You go to the doctor, they run tests on you before they even give you medicine. So he said, how do you find out what the issue is? I said, well, you use God's phone number, Jeremiah 33.3. He said, call unto me, and I will answer thee, sure. and I will show thee great and mighty things I know it's not. But that verse doesn't say he'll do great and mighty things for us, but it does say that he will show us things that we don't know. And I had two preacher friends that night in the auditorium, and uh, one of them was waving his hands. He wanted to tell a story. I said, okay, Gary, tell us a story. And Gary has a jail ministry. And uh, matter of fact, he's a chaplain in a prison now in Kentucky, but at that time he had a jail ministry. He said, I was in the jail witnessing these inmates, and this one inmate just kept disturbing, kept disturbing, kept disturbing. I couldn't get anything done. He said, finally, I just stopped everything, and I silently prayed. And I said, Lord, what's his issue? He won't even let us share the gospel with these other men. What's his issue? And the Holy Spirit said, ask him about his daddy, and then ask him about his uncle. So Gary looked at this man, never seen him before. The man never seen him before. He said, tell me about your daddy. He said, my daddy is dead. Gary said, well, what about your uncle? He said, when I asked him that question, he started screaming at me and said, who told you about that? His uncle had killed his daddy, and he was bitter. Wow. And he got gloriously saved because Gary prayed. The Lord showed him what the issue was, and it broke, and he got saved. One more quick story because, uh, Dr. Flynn, this is crucial to understand. A lost person is lost because a demon controls the way they think. And he controls the way they think through a particular mindset or stronghold or issue or sin, whatever you want to call it. But I was in West Virginia teaching this material. I was in four high school auditoriums and one community center uh, in, in West Virginia. And we'd invited the churches in the area to come. And I'd been home probably about three weeks. And one of the pastors called me. He said, Brother Lee, I heard you speak at Williamson High School Auditorium. He said, uh, and I want you to know I've won eight people to Christ since you were here. Wow. So he had won eight people to Christ in about three weeks. He was so excited. He said, one man, I was talking to him about the Lord. And he said, uh, while he was saying something to me, he said, I just silently prayed. And I said, Lord, what's his problem? I call it an issue or stronghold. He called it a problem. So he said, while he was saying something to me, I just silently prayed. And I said, Lord, what's his problem? He said, all of a sudden, the guy looked at me. He said, uh, do you want to know what my problem is? And he told him the issue that he had with God. Wow. And so that's the way it works. When we know what the issue is, we can deal with it. However, if you're praying for a lost person and you don't know what the issue is, uh, you can just command that stronghold to be shattered. And that's what he tells us to do in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. We're to pull down strongholds, their mindsets that's against the word and will of God. And it really means to shatter. So you shatter the stronghold. You bind the strong man and you shatter the stronghold through authoritative prayer. Here's the way you do it. You just say, Father, in Jesus' name, I command the stronghold that blinds Joe to the gospel, I command it to be shattered in Jesus' name. And you stay with that, and it will have to shatter because prayer is a spiritual is spiritual warfare, and uh, and the devil's stuff can't stand up against it. But we just have to stay with it until it happens. Amen. Awesome. Let me, uh, as, as a matter of fact, uh, in the book this morning, I got up at 3 o'clock. Didn't want to get up that early, but I got up that early. 
and I pulled this out and uh, I actually re-outlined it again and uh, then I re-outlined the first three or four chapters let me see but uh, chapter 5 on page 22 is spiritual warfare I yep. believe this is one of the best teachings I have ever read on spiritual warfare so how about telling us a little you know this was how about tell us a little bit about what you've learned about spiritual warfare because you just talked about a strong point and how it works well the lord taught me about spiritual warfare i've got a lot of books on it now but several years ago when i was still pastoring uh, we were having services one night and somebody got me during the invitation time said you need to come down here and, and so i went down to the school with them and there was an ambulance down there and police cars down there and one of our men thought he was jesus and they were about to take him to the psych ward in the hospital, and he wanted me to go with him, so I did. And so uh, I went to the hospital with him and uh, to the psych ward. And uh, before I left, he said, uh, Brother Lee, uh, he said, when I get out of here, I want you to help me. And so I went home from the hospital. I said, God, I don't know how to help him. He thinks he's Jesus. Uh, I, I don't have any idea what to do. And I just began to pray. And the Lord began to show me basically how it works. And so by the time he got out of the hospital and came to see me, I knew what kind of questions to ask him. I knew what I was looking for. And uh, and so so the Lord basically taught me this, uh, kind of like learning to swim. If somebody pushes you in, you have to learn how to swim in a hurry. Right. And that's right. kind of what I did. That's kind of like how we're doing on this broadcast, by the way. We learn how to swim by doing it. <laughs> yeah. I've learned more about spiritual warfare, though, since – probably since I've written the book than before I wrote the book, because I've seen it, uh, I've seen it work so many, so many times. And uh, so when I talk about spiritual warfare in the book, I'm not talking about capturing a city. You know, there are books out there about, you know, demons that control cities, authorities over cities. And, right. and I believe that, but I'm just what, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about what the Bible talks about. A strong man is the demon, the chief demon that controls a single lost person. Just like that, so, demon, when Jesus said, what's your name? He said, my name is Legion. That's that right. In control of that man. That's right. And so uh, you don't really have to know the demon's name, and I don't usually spend time fooling with that because you don't have to know the name of a city to drop a bomb on it, see? Right. And uh, so I, I, here's what I do. I just pray and say, Father, in Jesus' name, I bind the demonic spirit that controls this person's mind. Uh, and then I say, Father, in Jesus' name, I command the stronghold that blinds this person to the gospel, I command it to be shattered. So those are the two main things that you're doing when you pray for a lost person. Let me tell you another story because I think stories illustrate how it works. Better than me just say now, tell, tell me what you just said again. I want to write that down. You said you do two things, and just tell me what it is so I can write that down. You bind the strong man, and you... Pull down the stronghold, or the Bible calls it his armor. You take it away from him, which is the, the mindset. Mm -hmm. So you bind the strong the, the strong man, and you pull down the stronghold. And a lot of folk get those confused. Sometimes they try to pull down the strong man and bind the stronghold. Well, you don't do that. You bind the strong man. That means it's like putting handcuffs on him. He can't do what he's been doing. And uh, then you take away his armor, which he's trusting, which is the mindset. Now, you can pray that down, but if you're witness to someone, sometimes God will give you the word to share. For example, I was in uh, Virginia 10 years ago. I'll never forget it. I was in uh, four churches in five nights teaching this material. And there's a man there uh, who was a real estate agent, and he came every night. He heard the same material actually four nights in a row. And uh, he knocked on my door one morning. I was staying at his church, had a little uh, like a prophet's chamber. So that's where I was staying. And uh, he knocked on my door one morning. He said, Brother Lee, a lady called me early this morning. Oh, we lost Brother Lee. My. There it is. Go ahead. We lost you. It just came back on. Okay. So I prayed this short lost. All right. I said, Father, in Jesus' name, I bind the demonic spirit that controls this lady's mind. 
At this point, I did not even know her name. All I knew is strange stuff was happening in her house, demonic type stuff. So I prayed, Father, in Jesus' name, I bind the demonic spirit that controls her mind. That's all I prayed. Uh, we got in his car, went to her house, and it didn't take us long because she lived right by the church. I mean, you could throw a rock and hit her house from the church parking lot. Wow. And we went in, and he talks to her for a few minutes about not selling her house. And all of a sudden, she blurts out this statement. She said, I'm about to tell you something I've never told a living soul. When she made that statement, I knew she was about to tell us what the issue was in her life. But here's what I want you to see. When I prayed that prayer and said, Father, in Jesus' name, I bind the demonic spirit that controls her mind. Instantly, he was bound. That means he could no longer operate in her mind. Right. And within 30 right. minutes, she's saying, I'm about to tell you something I've never told a living soul. And then she told us this tragic story. She said in 1974, 31 years ago at the time, she said, I was in the Christmas play at church. She was a teenager. Mm -hmm. She said, uh, my mom was at the church. My little brother and sister was at the church. I was in the Christmas play. She said, my dad was drunk. She said, my dad came to the church drunk, grabbed my mom by her head, pulled her out of the church. Then she said, he came in and grabbed my little brother and sister, pulled them out of the church. Then she said he came in and grabbed me. She was in the Christmas play, pulled me out of the church. Then she said he tried to rape me, his own daughter. He was drunk. She got away from him. Then she said he took two sticks, and he tried to stick these sticks in my little brother's sister's ears. She said he tried to kill my little brother's sister by sticking sticks in her ears. Uh, he was drunk. Somebody called the police. Police came to pick him up. She said the last thing I ever said to my daddy while the police was taking him away, she said, I hope you die in jail. Mm -hmm. She said, the next morning, the policeman came back to the house. He said, I've got something I need to tell you. She said, I hope you came to tell us Daddy's dead. He mm -hmm. said, yes. He hung himself in the jail last night. Mm -hmm. She said, I didn't go to his funeral. She said, I've never even been to his to the cemetery. Mm -hmm. uh, 31 years, she'd never even been to her Daddy's cemetery. Matter of fact, she said, I hadn't even called him Daddy until today. Now that I knew what the issue was, it was bitterness. She was bitter, bitter at her dad because she had tried, he had tried to rape her. He didn't, but she tried to. She never got over it for 31 years. Uh, so I'm sitting on a little couch across from from her. Uh, she, her and my friend were sitting on the couch on the other side of the living room. I was sitting on the couch uh, opposite from them. And I didn't have a Bible, but against the left wall was a table that had a Bible on it. Her friend happened to be there, her neighbor. I said, would you please hand me that Bible? She hands me the Bible. I turned to Matthew 8, 18. Well, the Lord, uh, Peter asked the Lord, how many times do I forgive someone? Seven? The Lord said, no, 70 times seven. And then he told the story about a man that owed his Lord uh, what Dr. W.A. Criswell estimated to be $10 million. He didn't have the money, so his Lord forgave him this enormous debt. He goes out and finds a man that owes him about $17. He takes him by the throat. He says, I want my money. And the man said, if you'll give me a little time, I'll pay you. But he would not have had him thrown in prison for $17. His master hears about it, calls him back in. Wow. He said, you wow. wicked servant, I, gave, I forgave you that great debt. You wouldn't have mercy on your fellow servant. I'm turning you over the torments to your debts paid. And then I looked across, and then Jesus said in verse 35, uh, the last verse of Matthew 18, he said, so shall my heavenly Father do to every one of you, if you do not from your heart forgive every person that trespasses. I read that passage to her. I closed the Bible. I laid it on the coffee table in front of me. I looked across the room into her, her face. By this time, I knew her name. I called her by name, and I said, you'll never have the joy and peace of God until you forgive your daddy. I didn't witness to her. I didn't take her down the Romans road. I didn't use the four spiritual laws. I just shared what Jesus did. He told the rich young ruler, you got to get rid of your money. He told the woman, well, go call your husband. I don't have one. That's right. You live with a man you're not married to. He dealt with the issue, and I said, you'll never have the joy and peace of God and you forgive your daddy. She bowed her head and began to pray. She forgave her daddy for trying to rape her uh, many years ago. Uh, she had stuff against her mother. She forgave her mother. She thought about the man who sold her the house. She had stuff against him. She forgave him. She forgave everybody she could think of, which was all right, but I just said, you got to forgive your daddy. Then she told her neighbor, would you please call the pastor? I want to talk to him. Her neighbor calls the pastor. He's there within a few minutes because she lives right by the church. She told him what happened to her. Then she said, Sunday morning, I want to stand before the congregation, I want to tell them what God has done for me. And he said, if I start shouting, I just start shouting. You see, she'd been in prison for 31 years over the thing of bitterness toward her dad. 
Right. But when I prayed a simple prayer and said, Father, in Jesus' name, I bind the demonic spirit that controls her mind. He can no longer control her mind. And she said, I'm about to tell you something I've never told a living soul. This thing had happened over 30 years before. She never told anybody about it. And when she told me the story, I recognized what the issue was. I confirmed it with Scripture. It broke. And God set her free. And so that's the way we do it. That's what spiritual warfare is all about. Amen. I don't know what's happened to the to the screen, uh, but now I've got you down the corner. What what do you say? Do you see me down the corner or where? No, I see you full. I can see myself in the corner, but you're just like before. <laughs> well, I don't know what happened. It did a blip, and and I did a couple of things and couldn't change it back. That's awesome, my brother. So so you're telling me that uh, you you need to pray. You need to bind the strong man, and then you yeah. need to break the strongholds. That's and right. Are you telling me that we should pray for the Lord to show us what the strong man is specifically? Uh, no. Uh, the strong man is a chief demon. You don't know what, you have to know what his name is. You just bind him. Now, if you are witnessing to a person, it helps to know what, what the issue is so you can deal with it. See, that's what Jesus, he dealt with one issue with the rich young ruler, greed. The woman at the well, he dealt with one issue, the fact that she was living in adultery. And so there's always one issue that blinds a person to the gospel. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. If our gospel be hid, uh, it's hid to the lost in whom the God of this world hath blinded their minds. Right. Let the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is in God should shine unto them. So he doesn't blind the brain, he blinds the mind, the way you process information. So right. that's the stronghold. So you bind the strong man and you command the stronghold to be shattered. If you know what it is, you call it by name. If you don't, you just command the stronghold that blinds them to the truth to be shattered. Now, if you are witnessing to someone, you need to know what it is so you can confront it. Okay? Uh, I was in doing a revival meeting in Texas about three years ago. This older lady uh, came out to the foyer after the first service, and she said, would you help me pray for my granddaughter? And this granddaughter was now living with her, and this granddaughter's mother had died, and her brother had died, and I think she told me her dad had died, and... and uh, so she was living with this grandmother. She's about 15 or 16. And I said, I'll help you pray for her. And so Sunday night through Thursday night, the revival went from Sunday morning through Sunday, Thursday night. We, some of us met to pray. And each night, beginning of Sunday night, I prayed this simple prayer. I said, Father, in Jesus' name, I bind the demonic spirit that, uh, that blinds her. And I called her by name, this teenage girl, blinds her to the gospel. And I command the stronghold of bitterness to be shattered because from the story the grandmother told me, I knew she was bitter at the world because he'd been so tough on her. And I commanded the stronghold of bitterness to be shattered. I prayed that prayer Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night. I'd preach each night, give the invitation. This young lady didn't come. But on Thursday night, after we gave the invitation, nearly everything was gone, everybody was gone, just a few people. She comes to the pastor. She says, uh, Brother Terry, I need to get saved. And she had tears in her eyes. She, got, she was broken. But I prayed the same prayer five nights in a row. Father, in Jesus' name, I bind the demonic spirit that controls her mind, and I command the stronghold of bitterness to be shattered. In this case, I knew what the stronghold was, so I called it by name. But again, uh, if you're not doing the witnessing to the person, you don't really have to know what it is. You just command the stronghold that blinds them to the gospel to be shattered. But if you are witnessing to them, it helps to know what it is so you can either point it out to him or like Jesus did uh, or like the guy in, in jail I told you about. Uh, the Lord told Gary to ask him about his daddy and ask him about his uncle. So as soon as he asked about those two things and he, and he said, my uncle killed my daddy, Gary knew it was bitterness, you see. Right. And, then, you know, and so that's, that's the way it works. Wow. That is awesome. Well, let me tell you, for those who uh, I've seen people come in and go out that shows me on here, the viewers, how many we have, uh, if you would like to, if you'd like a copy of this uh, uh, video, I don't know how to tell you to get it yet, but I will. We are going to rebroadcast it several times so that you can sit and listen to this over and over. And Brother Lee, I apologize for not knowing how to to get you back large again because <laughs> it was on automatically. When you would speak, I would I would decrease, kind of like right. the Baptist said, I, I must decrease and he must increase. <laughs> but anyway, we'll but get... If they can save me to some degree in here, that's the main thing. Amen. 
Uh, I don't know whether you can see the offer that I've got up here. If you if you haven't, uh, you need to hit pop ins. If you hit pop ins, you see an offer that I have over here on the right side. Whenever uh, I talked to uh, Brother Lee again uh, last year, I asked him. I said, "Do you have do you, have you recorded this anywhere? Do you have any CDs or do you have any DVDs?" And he said, "Yes, I have a set of DVDs." So if you would like a set of MP4s, which you can download right now, uh, you can click where it says click to purchase. Can you see that on your screen, Brother Lee, on the right side? Uh, I don't know what I'm looking for there, but it's, it's probably there. And Andy could probably see it if he... You could, you could see Andy it. Andy says it's on there. I just don't know what I'm looking for. Uh, well, anyway, uh, right now there's an offer for those who, who might want to participate. Uh, there's a $60 offer for the C, uh, for the uh, MP4s that you can get tonight if you would like to get those. Now there's a $70 offer, and I've got to change this to I got to change this. I'm 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 having to learn how to do all this stuff. Uh, the $70 offering is with the with the hard copies, the the DVDs plus a book comes with it, and we'll mail that to you. And if I ever hit this word load up here, it'll show it'll show up. So that's uh, that's the offer that we have tonight, and I really I've had got a number of other things, but anyway, if you would like this book, literally the book, and you'd like the DVDs, it's seventy dollars. You can order it right now, right there where it says order now. And I'm telling you, back to this, back to this truth here. This is the book, and this is tools. This is some, this is one of the best tools. Uh, I would, you know, I I come from South Florida, and my daddy would make me grub hoe. Palmettas in South Florida, palmettas grow like weeds. They are weeds in a way, and, uh, and you need you need a good hoe, you need a good shovel. There's some tools that everybody that person needs, and this is a tool to teach you how to pray effectively for your family and for your friends, for everyone. So if you'd like, uh, if you'd like, uh, we're offering the DVD and the books and the book, and we'll mail that to you if you're in the U.S. Uh, for seventy dollars, you can order right now, and we'll have a record of that. And then we'll we'll get uh, Sister Sue, that's Lee's uh, wife, to mail that out to you. But if you would like, uh, let me see if I can change this offer. If you would like just the uh, uh, CDs, oh, I hit the wrong thing. All these all these mechanical things I'm learning to do. Load. Let's see if that works. If you'd like the book itself and with hard copy DVDs, they're seventy dollars. So we'd love for you to get them. Uh, I've got all of them. I'm, I was so busy getting ready tonight, I didn't bring my CDs up here. But this is some of the best teaching I've ever seen. Now, Brother Lee, uh, you said you're sixty-six years young, and uh, you are you are. You know, I talked to your son Andrew. He's uh, I think I heard him a moment ago. I talked to your son, your son Andrew, and uh, he said, "You know, I sure wish Daddy would get a vision of using the internet like we're doing tonight, because you are wearing yourself out by going to all these places." But let me just tell you, I, now I'm, if you're looking at me, I'm looking down at this corner. I'm looking down at Lee. Uh, uh, Lee is available uh, for uh, webinar, or not? Well, he was so going to be available for webinars uh, later. But he's uh, available for seminars and preaching, coming to a city and getting as many churches together as he can to minister to more people. So he he's available to do that. Uh, what is your website, Lee? It's uh, pelministries.org. P-E-L? P yeah, pelministries.org. Pray effectively. P for the lost. That's what it stands for. Yeah. Anyway, you can you can reach them right there, and so anyway, uh, I tell you, I I just uh, I outlined again this morning. Let me just kind of give you a breakdown of how this book goes. Now, the first chapter is so important because you, if you don't understand the first chapter of why it's imperative that we pray for the lost, you really may not do it. And but the second and the chapters after that tell us how. Uh, chapter two. Uh, begins with the biblical basis, uh, because we love our family, because we have faith in God, because of the power of prayer, because of our priority of prayer, and because of our biblical examples, Jesus and Paul's. 
And then the second part, the chapter three, talks about the personal uh, factor. And there's two major factors, which is re righteousness and faith. Now I tell you, if you're not right with God, you will not you will not witness. And you need to understand that you need uh, He imparts His righteousness to us. And we need to learn to walk by faith, but we also need to live right. And as we live right, we start to share the love of God. But we also have faith. The Bible is very clear that God. The Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Bible is very clear in the uh, second in Second Timothy chapter two, where it says. First of all, you pray for all those who are in authority and for all lost men, and God wants people to be saved. The Bible is very clear about what the will of God is. And when you know the will of God, which the Word of God reveals, then you can pray in faith. Faith prays and believes and receives, and then God moves and produces what you believe for. That's how faith works. So anyway, this is just a smattering tonight, uh, Brother Lee introducing uh, this subject to us. And these are these are both available. This is the book, uh, and the uh, the book and the uh, DVDs for seventy dollars. You can order them right here, right now. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna remove that to show you the lesser offer. The lesser offer is the uh, CDs that you can download right now. They are we got them ready, and you can. They're not CDs. I'm sorry. They're MPs. They're MP4s. They are ready, and you can get them tonight and you can begin to study them. Now let me just tell you, uh, when I saw Brother Lee, I believe it was in And we just lost uh, him speaking. Do you know anything about this? I just froze up on him. I'm still down in the corner, but yeah, it's just on his end. I wonder if he knows that. We, uh, he just went off, so I don't know. Am I still on? Uh, I'm not sure what happened on Dr. Flynn's end, but let me just keep sharing in case folks out there are still listening. Uh, the book really uh, makes it simple uh, and plain to, to pray for lost people. Uh, there are some many wonderful personal testimonies in there. Uh, that you can read, and uh, I've shared several tonight. They're not in the book, but uh, but lost people are dying and going to hell. Approximately uh, 57 million go to hell every single year, and uh, I mean that's pretty much an established fact. Uh, that's over a million a week, and uh, their only hope is for someone to pray for them and lead them to Christ, and so. Uh, I just want to. I just want to challenge you to do that. To, uh, well, get a copy of the book, uh, whatever you can do, and uh, and pray these principles, and uh, you will see. You will see results. We've seen incredible results uh, of uh, of people who pray for lost people and see them come to Christ. Well, which one are you talking about? Brother Lee. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, it's working back again. Uh, let me just tell you that all the videos that I've watched, every person who presented it and showed about the videos, every one of them promised you there's no way to stop mechanical things from happening 
bad or wrong. So yeah, uh, it took me it took me that long to get this thing back in. Apparently, when you were talking before, something uh, something popped in, and then it went out. So what I was talking about was the offer, and I'm going to put that back up, and it's uh, it's right there. I don't know whether anybody can see the offering. This is a sixty dollar. This is instant download. Uh, if you'd like to do that, you can get it right now. Uh, my my uh, my uh, web man just called me, and uh, I, maybe he's probably listening to me now. I don't know how we can send out an offer, but we will. But anyway, uh, Brother Lee, uh, I'm looking at my clock. Uh, we've been uh, we've been going an hour. I've worked yes. an hour and a half. How about uh, kind of uh, just just sharing some a few of the most important things that we've, we've got a number of people on here many of them are from africa and other places and we were talking about uh, getting up with you so that you could uh, they can invite you to come to their church uh how about just kind of summarizing and telling some of the most important things you've learned and uh, and tell us about how some of the people got saved as well just give us some testimonies with that well we've got we've got tons of testimonies. Uh, I've got a friend in Virginia, West Virginia that's a prophet. And he told me two and a half years ago, the Lord showed him we'd had over 3 million people say uh, worldwide. So the book is in about 40 languages now. And we got about a million and a half copies in print. And uh, it's literally gone all over the world. Uh, we had a couple from Andy's church who went to uh, Belgium uh, about a week ago. And, uh, I think she had won a trip or something through her business and they were having lunch with a man and the man in Belgium said, uh, have y'all ever read the book praying effective for the lost? <laughs> so here's a couple and she sent me an email. I mean, a text that morning, last Sunday morning, they're in Belgium having lunch with somebody. And this man's asking them if you read this book. And, uh, so we've like actually printed several thousand copies in Dutch over there. So, uh, anyway, the book's gone all over the world. And uh, we see that we see incredible things happen. The man I told you about that won the atheist, he had 48 names on his prayer list. And last August, about a year ago, uh, something crucial happened in his life. And that's when the Lord told him it's time to start witnessing these people you're praying for. Right. And I talked to him uh, back in probably February. And he said, uh, all 48 are now saved. Wow. And so he'd been praying for them for nearly about four years. But uh, he hadn't told them. So as we pray for them, somebody still got to tell them. Right. And, uh, and so I think what happens is we have a window of opportunity after you bind the storm. And for example, in Matthew 12, the Lord talks about how a man, the demon goes out of a man and he can't find a place he likes. So he comes back to his house. And so uh, we can bind the strong man. But I think if we don't get the gospel to him within a, reasonable period of time the demon will come back and uh so uh so we pray for people and we need to we need to witness to them at, uh, also just praying for them is not not good enough That's we, right. have, we have incredible testimonies i had uh i was sharing this material in the church about 40 miles from where i live and uh there was a lady that 56 years old who got such a, a burden for her family members Every Sunday morning, she'd stand up and say, please help me pray for my family members. Then she would name them. She did this every Sunday. The pastor called and told me the story. Then she told her daughter one day, she said, when I die, I want y'all to have an altar call at my funeral. Four months after I was there, this lady, 56 years old, suddenly fell dead. Uh, the daughter told the pastor she won't have an altar call at her funeral. So he preached a funeral in a funeral home about 40 miles from where I live, gave an altar call, and 16 of her family members got up out of their seats Came down front, prayed, to receive Christ as Lord and Savior. Amen. That's I was in the church. I was in the church about two years ago, and uh, about three weeks later, got an email from a young lady in her mid twenties, and she said, "Brother Lee, my uh, brother was a drug addict. He was in such bad shape, I thought he was going to die on drugs." She said, "I started praying these principles you taught us," and she said, "He got gloriously saved. He got baptized." She said, "His girlfriend was a drug addict. I prayed for her, and she got gloriously saved." Uh, but she said the girlfriend's mother was a witch and would not let her daughter come out of the drug culture. She said, I started praying for her and she got saved. All that happened in about three weeks after one woman 
begin to apply the principles of right. praying for right. those people. Right. Uh, we just we see that kind of stuff all the time, all the time. I was uh, I was in a church teaching this material in a Baptist church, and uh, when I finished, uh, a, la- a guy came up to me, an older guy. He said, "Brother Lee, I'm from the Nazarene Church, and I've been in about twenty different denominations. God just opened doors for me everywhere." And he said, we ordered six books from you for, we got six ladies in our church whose husbands are lost. Now, I don't know why he didn't want a book for everybody, but he, want, he wanted a book for these six ladies. He said, uh, I gave the books out to these ladies on a Wednesday night at church. And uh, she said, one, he said, one of the ladies had been praying for a husband between 25 and 30 years. He said, I gave her the book on a Wednesday night. Her husband got saved that Saturday. Amen. And so once she learned how to pray the principles, her husband got saved almost immediately. I was in another church. I shared this material. It was on a Monday night. I'll never forget it. And there was a young man there who had surrendered to preach. He was going to seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. And his mom and dad were both lost. They lived in Florida. When he surrendered to preach, they basically quit speaking to him. They didn't want him to be a preacher. He went home that night, prayed the principles I shared. His dad got saved the next morning. Wow. He came and told the church about it. The pastor called and said, hey, can you come back on a Sunday morning? We'll have more people. So I came back on a Sunday morning. We had a packed house. But his dad got saved the very next morning after he prayed these principles. So we see we see stuff like this happen all the time. Just incredible, incredible testimonies. So what you what you're saying is, and this is important to know this. What you're saying is, when we when we get serious about doing this, and we 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 uh, bind the strong man, we shatter the strongholds. The Holy Spirit begins to move on them. And the light comes so they can be saved and get, they get saved. Is that, is that what you're telling yes. me? Yes. Yes. Let me, let me share with you uh, something that happened to me that really uh, that showed me we need to do more than just pray or, or more than just witness. And we, did, we need to do both. And the book teaches that. Uh, I, led, uh, I, I started witnessing, as I told you again, I started to get cranked back up and, and I go uh, to a wellness center every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. I spend about three hours there, and I'm in a class there, and I've just got to know, gotten to know everyone, and I've gotten a pretty good relationship with an older gentleman. He's 80, you know, he's a little older than me. And anyway, I, I got the opportunity. I asked him. I asked him. I said, "Could uh, uh, have you ever heard of the four spiritual laws?" He said, "No." I said, "Could I share them with you?" He said, "Oh yeah." And so anyway, I took him through the four spiritual laws. And then I read him the prayer at the end, and uh, I asked him, I said, Don, does this prayer express the desire of your heart? He said, yeah. I said, could I pray it for you, and you pray after me? He said, yeah. And so anyway, he prayed that prayer, which is something like, God be merciful and me a sinner and save me and take me to heaven when I die. That's how I prayed. Anyway, I don't have have one of those at my fingertip, but he prayed the prayer with me, and that was like on a Thursday. And uh, I called him the next week. I, I, actually, I was busy, and he something happened the next week. Anyway, I called him the week after that. He wasn't there on Tuesday. And uh, I asked him, I said, Don, we missed you at the, at the wellness center, and what's going on? I said, well, how are you doing? And he said, well, I'm, I'm now I'm doing better. He said, I don't, don't need my brace, and I'm getting around a little bit better. I said, great. I said, but how are you doing spiritually? He said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, you prayed a prayer to receive Jesus with me. And I said, you asked him to come in your heart. I said, so how are you doing spiritually? He said, well, I I don't know. I don't know any difference. Well, he didn't get saved. And so anyway, I I said, Lord, I didn't get shook up. You know, we plant the seed. But I want to do better in witnessing, just like you want to do better in praying. And I said, Lord, I, I don't know, you know, even I love the four spiritual laws, but people who are praying this prayer are not being transformed. You know, they just pray a prayer. And we're living in a time of easy grace, of easy, easy, believism, easy believism, sloppy agape, and greasy grace. We just promise people the world without repentance, and that's a fact. But anyway, I'm getting to a point. Uh, the point is spiritual warfare, and the point is what, what we need to look God to do. Anyway, uh, I was... Uh, the next Thursday, left. I left the wellness center, and I was driving to where I was going, and I heard uh, Dr. Jeremiah teaching. I don't know what he's teaching about, but he said, you've got to have revelation 
to ha to have repentance. And I, I can't remember exactly what it said, but I wrote down this thing. Revelation brings repentance so you can be regenerated and resurrected from the dead. I've got eight things. I've got my notes here, which I'm not going to get dwell on. But it dawned on me. I said, that's right. Until people have revelation, they cannot see. Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Uh, you, you must be born again to enter, the, to see the kingdom of God. And, and there's, we need to pray that God would open their eyes so they can see, so they can see what they are, who they are, and what they've got to do to be saved. And that, what they've got to do is humble themselves. The Bible says God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. People are arrogant. They're proud. They don't want to repent. So the first part of repentance is humility. And they can't humble themselves until they see what they are, till they see how lost they are, till they see how much God loves them. And when they do, they can see, they can pray that prayer and enter into the kingdom of God and be resurrected from the dead. I promise you, if people didn't get resurrected, if they didn't get regenerated, if they didn't get changed, they didn't get saved. And the problem is people are not bringing them to the place of humility and repentance. But what I'm saying for us We've got to pray that God will show us what the strong man is and how to pray and give them light so they can see. That's my point. So it takes revelation as well. Well, they, they cannot receive revelation because they're blinded, see. That's the problem. It's like taking a blind man out and look at the sunset. Doesn't matter how beautiful it is. Doesn't matter how well you explain it. He's blind. He can't see it. You can take him out every day of the year. He still can't see it. He's blind. And so... A lost person, according to 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, is blinded to the gospel. And so what we're doing is when we bind the strong man and take away the stronghold, those blinders are removed. And then it's the Holy Spirit's job to uh, to give them the revelation they need. You and I can share the gospel with them, but until the Holy Spirit makes it be real to them, they won't get saved. And so in, in uh, the book, I talk about how uh, the Lord sanctifies a lost person. And I, when I teach it uh, in person, uh, I use a hula hoop. Right. And I put a hula hoop around me to represent what I call a circle of sanctification. So when you and I pray for lost persons, and we do our job by buying this strong man and taking away his armor, the Holy Spirit does his job by sanctifying. And the word sanctify means to be set apart. It literally comes from the Greek word hagios, which means to be made holy. So the Holy Spirit makes the lost person holy before you ever get saved. And uh, I was teaching this in Indiana in a church, and this guy come up to every service and said, man, don't tell people the Holy Spirit makes lost people holy uh, before they get saved. And I said, well, that's what the Bible teaches. Mm -hmm. First Peter 1, 2 teaches that. Peter said uh, we are we are the elect according to the foreknowledge of God through sanctification of the Spirit. Paul says the same thing in 2 Thessalonians, uh, verse 13, 14. Uh, From the beginning, we were chosen to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit. So here's the thing. The only sin that's unforgivable according to Jesus in this world or world come is blaspheming the Holy Ghost. And the reason that's true is because only the Holy Spirit can bring a person to the place of being saved. You can right. blaspheme the Father, you can blaspheme the Son, uh, and you'll get forgiveness. But if you turn your back on the Holy Spirit, he's the only one that can bring you under conviction and show you how to be saved. So this is important. So let me show you how this works. Uh since the Holy Spirit must do his part, when we do our part, he always does his. In order for the Holy Spirit to bring a lost person under conviction and deal with him, he first has to make him holy. So let me use a couple of Old Testament illustrations. When God showed up in the burning bushy spirits with Moses on the backside of the desert, the very first thing he said to Moses is, Moses, take off your shoes. Right. You're on holy ground. Now, this was just the backside of the desert. Uh, Moses had been keeping Jethro sheep for for several years there, same area. It was just the backside of the desert. When God shows up, it's not just desert anymore, it's holy ground. When God comes down and meets with Moses on the mountain and gives him what we call the Ten Commandments today, he said, Moses, if an animal touches the mountain, the animal dies. If a person touches the mountain, the person dies. God had made the mountain holy. Only he and God could touch the mountain uh, because he was coming down to meet with him. So wherever God goes has to be a holy place. And so in order for the Holy Spirit to work on a lost person, he has to make him holy first. Wow. Uh, for example, 
when uh, Noah sent out a dove and a raven to check out the receding flood waters. The raven found carnage, the Bible says, and didn't come back to the ark. But the Bible says the dove could find no clean spot for the sole of his foot. And so the dove came back to the ark. And in scripture, the dove is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit sanctifies the lost person. He makes him holy so he can prepare his heart for salvation. Now, uh, let me say a word about family members getting saved. Nearly every family has lost family members. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 14, the Bible says if a, if a wife is married to an unsaved husband, the unsaved husband is sanctified by the wife. And the opposite is true. If the man saved, the wife's not, she's sanctified by the husband. So here's what that means. When a man and a woman get married, they become one flesh. And if a woman is a Christian, she's sanctified. She has a circle of sanctification about it. She's holy. We are holy not because of how we live. We're holy because of whose we are. And so when you, uh, and that's one place the devil trips us up. He makes us think we're not holy because we did something we shouldn't have done. Well, we might have shouldn't have done it, but we're not holy because we do or don't do something. We're holy because of whose we are. We belong to God. Right. So if the woman is a Christian, she's sanctified. And if the man is not, since they're one flesh, he's in her circle with her. And so that means he's sanctified. He's holy. That gives the Holy Spirit a right to work on him, and he will work on him. I don't know how many men have come up to me after they heard me teach this and say, Brother Lee, my wife prayed for me 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. I was in South Carolina two years ago. We had a meeting, several churches involved. And uh, this lady came up to me uh, after the service. Uh, she was one of many, but she said, Brother Lee, my husband was a Jew. And she said, I prayed for him uh, for uh, uh, years and years and years and years. And she said, he finally got saved at the age of 70. And she said, here he is, and I met him. Yeah. So this woman had prayed for her Jewish husband for years and years and years, and finally at the age of 70, he got saved. And so, uh, so a lost husband... If he's married to a saved wife, he's in her circle. That means in God's sight, he's holy. And that gives the Holy Spirit the right to work on him. Now, the rest of that verse, this is the key verse, 1 Corinthians 7, 14. The rest of that verse says, else were your children unclean, but now they holy. Right. That means if the wife is a Christian and the husband's not, the children are holy because of the wife, because they belong to her. And uh, that gives the Holy Spirit the right to work on children. And if we believe God for our children and pray for our children and live the kind of life in front of them that uh, they need to see, God will save our children. He wants to save our children. I was in Cheyenne, Wyoming, teaching this material, and I've taught it hundreds of times. And all of a sudden it hit me. I was talking about how the, God wants to save entire families. The Bible teaches household salvation. Now, every person must get saved individually, but he wants the whole family to get saved. Cornelius and his household got saved. Christmas, the head of the synagogue of his household got saved. Uh, Lydia and her household got saved. And while I'm in Cheyenne, Wyoming, teaching this material, all of a sudden it hits me. In the Bible, a household included folk who were not blood kin. They right. include servants and slaves. Right. And so here's what God showed me while I was actually teaching material, that if you own a business and you've got people working for you, those people are literally in your biblical household because you are providing their living. And if as a boss, you live a godly life and pray for them, God will save, uh, he'll save the people that's working for you. Wow. But, uh, but that's what God does. He sanctifies a lost person uh, so the Holy Spirit can work on them and bring them under conviction and draw them to that place of, uh, of trusting Christ. Amen, brother. That word sanctify means be set apart. And it's so what, what, what happens is when, they, when they're joined in that union, that actually sets them apart for the, just like you show the uh, 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 hula hoop, it actually releases the Holy Spirit to begin to bring the light of God and the conviction they need to have so they can be saved. Yes. Yes. Amen. Awesome, Brother Lee. Oh, man, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I, you know, we had about a five-minute glitch. If I was faster on a computer, I'd have redone it. <laughs> It took me five minutes to figure out how to redo it, but okay, uh, right. yeah, but I'm learning. So everyone listening to me, I just want to tell you we've had uh, Dr. Lee Thomas ministering from uh, Westlake. What is where is it? Louisiana, Westlake, what, Louisiana. What is the name of the city again? Uh, Lake Charles is the main city around close to us. 
but, but your your city is what? Westlake. Westlake. Okay, Westlake Leadership yeah. Center. And your website again is PELministries.org. PELministries.org. That's how yeah. you can get up with your brother. Uh, right, right now on the board on the right side, if you don't see it, hit uh, pop ins if you've got that on your computer. Uh, we're offering his book, literal book, and the uh, six, uh, the four uh, DVDs for seventy dollars. That gets you the that gets you the thing. This gets you the whole story. Gets you not only the book. Whenever I I'd read the book, I'd studied the book, I'd outlined the book, and when I got the when I got the the DVDs, I said, "My goodness, it shed so much light on the book, just like you're doing tonight." Uh, I'm going to take that one down. And uh, we have another offer where you can get the same uh, CDs, not DVDs, uh, but get them in MP4s right now, tonight, for $60. So they're available right now. And we're going to be on there just a few more minutes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play, a uh, in closing, I'm going to play one of the videos that we loaded up just, just for others to hear and see uh, one of the videos that you had, you might, you might want to watch that. And then I'm going to, when I get done, I'm going to see if anybody would like to receive Jesus and close this out. Amen. Okay. So let me go ahead. Uh, I don't, I can't leave this offer up. So I'm going to play, uh, that one video where you were, uh, uh, on that big television program. All right. Select video day star interview. Load it up. Eight minutes. So after this, I'm going to pray for everyone. And uh, let's watch this video.
Amen. Brother Lee, let's, uh, let's use that power and unity. I said I was going to pray for the lost. I want to agree with you. I, I do want to pray after you finish, but I want to agree with you. I want you to, to bind the strong man and, and, and break the strongholds. I want you to pray the way you pray for those who are watching and their families, and then I'm going to pray for people to be saved. So do that for us, please. Father, we do pray tonight for uh, the folk that are lost and uh, many people that are watching this have family members or friends that are, that are lost. And I pray you give them insight in, uh, in how to do this. And so, Father, in Jesus' name, I do bind the strong man uh, that controls the lost people for those that are going to be praying later tonight. Uh, that controls their mind, and I command the stronghold, whatever it might be, that blinds them to the truth. I command it to be shattered in Jesus' name. And Lord, I ask you for the Holy Spirit to move in and sanctify each one, and the Holy Spirit begin to bring revelation of the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ to them. They'll be plain and clear and, and simple, just like the wild man of Kadera. And Lord, I pray that these folk will be saved. I pray you'll save many tonight. And uh, Lord, we give you the praise and the glory and honor for hearing our prayers. Thank you for the folks, Lord, that have tuned in to hear this. And Lord, I pray that uh, this message will go all over the world, not only in book form, but in video. And, and Lord, that multiplied millions of souls will be saved. And I thank you for Dr. Flynn and what he's doing and bless him, giving him health and strength and use him for your glory uh, continually. And we'll give you the praise for all this in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. You're watching, we're getting ready to close now. Let me just tell you, I learned the, I've learned another way to witness. I use now the bridge illustration and to go across that bridge, there's five steps, but I'm going to give you three real quick. Like, first of all, you've got to humble yourself. The Bible says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace for by grace, you are saved. He gives grace to the humble. If you'll humble yourself tonight, and change your mind and your attitude towards the Lord. That's repentance. And turn from your will and turn from your ways to the Lord Jesus and call upon his name. He will save you. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let me lead you in a prayer. I want to give you the simplest prayer you've ever heard. Pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I need you. Please come into my heart and save me and make me a new person and take me to heaven when I die in Jesus name. If you humble your heart before the Lord, repent in your attitude and your, your rebellion and your will and submit to the Lord. He made you for a plan for a purpose. He'll give it to you when you call upon his name. He'll save you. The offer for the, uh, the, Videos that are there now and ready to be downloaded are is on the screen on my screen. I don't know if it's on yours or not. This is our first webcast. We're going to start next week. Uh, this uh, next week we'll have uh, Dr. Mark Berkler. He's written over fifty-one books, and his uh, his basic book is Communion with God: How to Hear God's Voice. That'll be our theme next week. And then the week after that, John Thompson is going to minister on discipleship. So God has called mature men who've learned principles that change lives. And that's what we want to have people who've learned and grown in the Lord. So God bless you. Uh, this is going to rerun four or five times this week. We'll send you an email and let you know when, because I don't, we don't know all the technical things yet. This is our first broadcast. We're excited about it. And we thank you. Lord bless those who are watching tonight. Thank you for each of them. I release your anointing. We break the yoke and, and bless them. And thank you for them in Jesus' holy name. God bless you. Brother uh, uh, Lee, thank you so much for being on. Uh, Brother Andrew, his son, who helped us with the technical things, thank you so much. God bless you. We're hitting stop broadcast now, and we'll see you next week, and you'll get an email with information later. Bye-bye.